Thank you very much, Katrina, and it's a real pleasure to be here at the launch of the uh, Peritia uh, project. It's a very exciting project, and it seems to be coming at exactly the right moment in time, so I'm really looking forward to my involvement. Um, I'm going to stand slightly to one side because I tend to disappear behind these lecterns. You can hear me, but you can't see me. Um, I want to start with a small story about bees and the possible impact on bees of neonicotinoid pesticides. And I take uh, what I'm going to say from a report that appeared in Nature um, two or three years ago, and Nature was itself reporting on an important paper that had come out in the journal Science on the same day. The paper was reporting uh, the largest field study to date at that time on neonicotinoids and their effect on bee populations. And for a number of years, because laboratory studies had suggested that neonicotinoid pesticides were dangerous for bees, then uh, people had been calling for more research, and in particular calling for field studies. So this paper was very important, as it was the report of a very large field study. Bees are difficult because they move around, and you can't necessarily um, just treat them like laboratory objects. So overall, this paper found that exposure to neonicotinoid pesticides harms bee populations, and that the pesticides had significant negative effects at critical life stages for the bees. However, as with many field studies, which are carried out in rather open systems, the findings were not entirely clear-cut. This is how they were received. The results were warmly welcomed by all the groups who'd been advocating further controls on neonicotinoid pesticides. However, scientists from the two major producers of neonicotinoid pesticides, who had also been the main funders of the research, as it happens, questioned the data analysis and they questioned the conclusions and indeed, they argued that the negative conclusions of the paper, that harm was being done, uh, were unwarranted or even unfair, was the word used by one. The researchers who'd done the work emphasised how independent they were, that the paper had been peer-reviewed and that they stood by their conclusions. A DEFRA spokesperson, DEFRA's the UK Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, said the government will be led by science on this matter. As it happens, the EU placed further restrictions on neonicotinoid pesticides uh, a little under a year later. And I mention that small story because it typifies many dilemmas in environmental governance, where the evidence is almost always incomplete. This leads to calls for more research, and the findings of that research are then, in turn, contested. Interestingly, and we've heard a bit about this already today, interestingly, the findings are interpreted differently by different groups with interests in the matter at hand. So I am actually going to draw on what, uh, in what I say on environmental governance, which has been the subject of my own research for the, more or less the whole of my career. Um, and I'm also going to focus, since there are many different kinds of expertise for different purposes, I'm going to focus on expert advice intended to inform policy formation in modern democracy. So that's, that's the area that I'm looking at. I will address some questions about trust in and the trustworthiness of expert advisors and expert advisory bodies. And in all that I say, I'll be drawing 
um, to a considerable extent on the All European Academies project, Truth, Trust and Expertise, uh, with which I was involved, and on my own research, particularly um, the work that Katrina mentioned, a rather forensic study of one of Britain's longest standing environmental advisory bodies, the rather grandly titled Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, which existed for 41 years before it was finally abolished in 2011. So it's rather a treasure trove for anyone interested in that strange nexus between research, evidence and policy. I was also a member of that body for 10 years, so I did, if you like, a kind of ethnographic work on it as well as a member. <coughs> I want to draw out during the process of the talk two distinctions that seem to me to be increasingly important if scientists and other experts are to engage effectively with politics and policy making. The first distinction is that between, on the one hand, very familiar characterizations of experts and their role in the policy process. And on the other hand, what we have learned, what we've actually learned about um, well, through both research and experience, about the very complex and contingent nature of the interactions between science, I use the term in its broadest sense, and policy in the real world. So if you like, the simplistic models of expert policy relationships and uh, what we've begun to learn about that, that relationship as it is. The second distinction I'd like to draw out is between, on the one hand, what we might think of as unreasoned distrust in, or even the outright rejection of expertise. That's one side of it. On the other hand, reasoned skepticism and legitimate questioning of expert claims. So I want to draw out that distinction in my talk as well. How do we think about expertise? I imagine everyone in the room has a kind of mental model of how experts work and what their effects are in advising governments in modern democracies. Perhaps the most familiar model is that the one I call the linear rational model in which experts provide dispassionate advice for the guidance of those in power. Implicit in that model is a fact-value distinction. The experts provide the analysis and the facts, the evidence, and it's down to the policymakers and politicians to make judgments of value. So they're neatly separated in totally different um, camps and, and uh, with a clear boundary between the two. I don't want to dwell on this model except to observe that despite powerful critiques, um, not least on the grounds of um, the assumed rationality of the policy process and the assumed neutrality of experts, both of those have been demolished, despite powerful critiques, it's an incredibly tenacious model. It's a sort of zombie model almost. It keeps coming back to life, how, however much we demonstrate its, its lack of credibility in the real world. So this is a model um, in which experts feed into the policy process in a relatively unproblematic manner, which is widely proclaimed still, um, even as another rather different model is widely suspected. So let me move on to the model that's widely suspected. Uh, for shorthand, I'll call it the strategic model. Basically, this is the model in which political actors only take notice of expert advice when it suits, when it says what they want to hear. Um, and they use it, 
they use expert advice selectively, cherry picking the bits that say uh, the things that suit. And they use it sometimes strategically. It's a time-honoured strategy to set up a commission or a committee to look at something when you don't really want to do anything much about it just now, to kick it into the long grass. But So that model, I think, is also inadequate and has also been criticised, not least because it tends to push knowledge out of the picture in policy-making altogether. Policy makers act on lots of different things, but the knowledge itself in that second strategic way of thinking is epiphenomenal. It's there, but nobody really cares. Don't take any notice of it. What actually I observe now is that both of these familiar models coexist amidst a chorus of competing claims. So on the one hand, we have the frequent daily claims, like the one from the DEFRA spokesperson that I mentioned at the beginning, that the government is going to make the decision based on the science. Um, or, as a rather nice headline put it in the Times the other week, give me the facts, referring to the claim by our Secretary of State for Transport in the UK, that the decisions on the controversial high-speed rail link 2 will be taken based only on the evidence and the facts. I don't know why anyone is laughing at that, that at all. I can't imagine. So we have these sorts of claims, and yet at the same time a kind of chunnering and grumbling that nobody's actually much taking any notice of the evidence or the facts, if there are any facts in that particular field. Um, and um, a sense, I, I saw something about this the other day, but all of us who've served on advisory bodies feel it sometimes. Why on earth do you set up a body to give you expert advice if you're not actually going to act on its findings? Well, there might be good reasons for doing it, but you know that, that, that's a frustration. Or the kind of frustration that maybe governments take very important decisions, not only without attention to the facts, but actually flying in the face of the evidence. That was nicely expressed, I think, by Sir John Lawton when he gave uh, his address as president to the British Ecological Society some years ago. He said rather plaintively, why does it seem so difficult to get politicians and policymakers to adopt what to us are obvious steps to protect the natural environment. So amidst these competing views of the role of expertise and its relations with the policy process, we need to look more, we as, as scholars and people who are interested in this issue, need to look more closely, more forensically at what actually happens. And there have now been more studies uh, of expert advisory practices and how, what, what their effects are in the real world. Katrina's work on the Norwegian advisory commissions is one that has been Sheila Jasnoff's work in the US, uh, a major study of the, of the Health Council of the Netherlands, and my own work on, on the Royal Commission attempting to do that too. And I couldn't possibly summarise, but let me just say a few words about some of the main findings of very detailed research on advisors and advisory bodies in the policy process. So, um, first, they've unpicked both common assumptions about knowledge and evidence. And they've also looked very closely at the way policy processes actually work and what the most important factors are in those policy processes. That helps us, uh, and of course the findings are nearly always, what I mentioned a few moments ago, that the interactions among knowledge, expert advice, politics and policy making are both complex and contingent, as in some ways you might expect, which helps to explain what we observe. 
which that if you look at a particular advisory body and the fate of its advice, you find that it's sometimes very rapid, direct hit, yes, straight away, taken up. Sometimes very slow and diffuse amidst a body of other advice and work. Sometimes non-existent because its advice doesn't have any effect at all. And sometimes extremely long term. The body I've studied, the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, its advice was on one occasion taken up within 35 minutes. And on another occasion, its advice, still recognisably its advice, became British policy after 15 years. So there are widely varying timescales for, for advice to take effect. We learn that the advice, of course, has crucial epistemic dimensions. You'd expect expert advisers to have knowledge and you'd expect them to be able to synthesise knowledge and communicate with policymakers. But it also has um, other crucial roles. The role of framing problems and policies, articulating the advice, communicating it. Um, so the role is not just cognitive or epistemic or analytic, but also involves skillful framing judgment, and the building of trust. So in the case of the Health Council of the Netherlands, Fieber Biker and her colleagues argued that it wasn't just about giving the politicians the facts, but it was a well-argued reflection on the state of knowledge in relation to the state of the world, on whatever topic they were looking at. In the Royal Commission's case, the body that I studies studied, I concluded that its deliberations came closer to a form of practical public reasoning than to any technically oriented appraisal of the facts. So we see, when we look closely, expert advisers neither as simply rational analysts nor as ciphers or political symbols, but actually as agents of policy learning, sometimes taking place quickly, sometimes taking place slowly, as agents of boundary work and as constructive boundary workers. In the sense that Thomas Gearing used the term, one would see advisers constructing and defending boundaries between science and politics in areas where they may not be very clear-cut. But crucially, most of the studies have also shown that skillful advisers bridge those boundaries as well, and they produce what Jasanoff calls serviceable truths, which are intelligible in the worlds of both science and politics, and therefore are extremely useful boundary objects in that sense. So... Our models, I think, have become more complex than the simple ones. I like to think of those first two simple models as very special cases of a much more complex reality. Let me move on to say something about trust and trustworthiness and to address the question that others have raised. Is trust in expertise in decline? Is it really in decline or not? Why have claims that experts are no longer valued or trusted become so prevalent? Well, it may be. I'm going to look first at very, very briefly at some of the evidence that suggests that what Tom Nichols calls the death of expertise has been much exaggerated, rather like the death of one prominent British personality who wrote to the Times letters page one day to say um, uh, my, the, the news of my death has been much exaggerated. And I, I, you know, I, there is some evidence of, of, of this kind. So people don't always behave as if they don't trust experts. I pretty much trusted the pilot of the plane who flew me here to 
get me here. Someone else has raised that issue. And all of us do place our trust in experts in an everyday way, though that isn't quite the same as trusting them to advise governments on policy. It's a slightly different thing. But our behaviour is that we haven't totally lost trust in experts. Bobby Duffy mentioned opinion polls, and those do indeed tend to show, if we look at the ipsos uh, mori veracity indices, as they call, they come out every year. In fact, I can, I can cut the detail here and sum it up, because early this morning I, I googled Ipsos Mori just to see if there was anything new out recently, but I didn't get any further than a site headline which said, it's a fact. Scientists are the most trusted people in the world. <laughs> so I thought, okay, <laughs> That'll, that'll do for now. So I was going to give you a more complicated <laughs> version of that. There's no point. So, um, yes, they, come, well, they do rather well in those polls. Though, of course, opinion polls give us a snapshot of what... They do what they say on the can. They give you a snapshot of opinion, what people think at any one point in time... They don't, in themselves, give you a deep understanding of how people form their views and values. And you do have to pay quite close attention to the questions that are actually asked. In the Ipsos Mori Veracity Index polls, it's, do you trust this profession to tell the truth? Which is a very specific question, I think. Um, and and uh, so, with those, with those caveats, Opinion polls do tend to show quite a lot of trust in professors and scientists, which should be good news for many people in the room. One quite interesting finding from various polls, though, is that often people express a greater level of trust in what they perceive to be independent scientists and lower levels of trust in um, scientists who, who they perceive to be at the behest of governments or industry. Okay. One might also add, just on that side of the balance, that public interest in and appetite for some forms of science, at least, seems to be very high, um, certainly in the UK, but I believe in many, in many countries, the popularity of, of nature programmes and um, also actually programmes about astronomy are very, very popular too. So there, is some, there are some indications that maybe people haven't completely lost. Maybe there's not a complete crisis of trust in expertise. But there are causes for concern as well on the other side of this balance, about loss of trust. So, Yose has given us a, an excellent um, account of issues related to um, the production and consumption of misinformation and disinformation, fake news, false claims, and so on. Um, not new in themselves, but amplified by uh, the availability of digital media and the sheer speed by which things can spread around. And I don't want to repeat the very excellent points that USA made. Um, I'll just add a couple of observations. So one is that in populist narratives, there does seem to be a particular denigration of expertise. And that is, I, th I think, a, a, cause, a cause for concern. The other issue that I want to spend a little bit more time on is uh, a rather different set of phenomena that have also been interpreted as a decline of trust in expertise or... Uh, um, a lack of valuing of expertise. And the sorts of phenomena that I have in mind are an uneasiness about certain directions of scientific inquiry, 
or challenges to expert claims in science policy controversies, or resistance to some kinds of techno-scientific innovation. And the responses to many of those challenges or concerns or uneasiness uh, tend to be claims that the critics don't understand the science and or even are unscientific and that is often accompanied by further efforts to reiterate the science. Now the argument I want to try really is that um, this is why there's such a crucial distinction to be made between, on the one hand, willful distortion or unwarranted rejection of well-established knowledge and expertise, and on the other hand, legitimate questioning of expert claims and particular directions of travel in science and technology. Some of those criticisms, some of that uneasiness, some of those concerns are nothing to do with not understanding the science. They are genuine concerns about the direction in which some things are travelling. And so I think we have something of a difficulty here, and I don't quite know how to address it. And the difficulty is this. For, for a number of decades now, social scientists, from political science, science and technology studies, a number of other disciplines, have made a huge contribution to our understanding of knowledge policy interactions by um, looking in much more detail at uncertainties and the nature of uncertainties, ambiguities, indeterminacies. They have questioned fact-value distinctions in contexts such as risk analysis, for example. They have looked at the way in which problems are framed so that certain policies may or may not be relevant solutions to those particular problems. And I think the real challenge is now to distinguish that kind of work which talks about the nature of truth and uncertainty and framing from the scepticism, the rejection of expertise, the willful distortion of truths. And I think that's quite a difficult task, and it may be a particular challenge for social scientists. So we don't want to be in the uncomfortable position of somehow sometimes being associated with fake news and skeptics and, and, and so on. I think you, you see the point I'm getting at, and I would love to hear people's views about how that distinction can be made very clearly. Um, Tom Nichols again puts it quite nicely, I think, when he says, reason scepticism is essential, not only to science, but also to a healthy democracy. And, and that's very important. Uh, I should finish that little sort of strand of thought by saying... There are occasions, of course, where mistrust, or at least a degree of scepticism um, towards expertise, may be well placed, healthy. Let me suggest four, and these align quite well with ten, um, ten worries that, that Katrina and uh, Anders, uh, your colleague Anders Malanga, have expressed in, in a recent paper. So I'll just pick, on, pick four. First, experts are not omniscient. They get things wrong and they disagree with each other, and that's good. Secondly, experts don't much resemble the neutral, disinterested, dispassionate advisors of the linear rational model. Rather, as David Kennedy expresses it in his book, A World of Struggle, expert knowledge is human knowledge, a blend of conscious semi-conscious and wholly unconscious ideas full of tensions and contradictions inhabited by people who have projects and who think, speak and act strategically. Thirdly, experts by definition 
we hope, have competence. They have a competence in their particular area of expertise. But as Stephen Turner and others have argued, they don't always have competence competence, which is the competence to recognise the limits of their own competence. So very often, unfortunately, we do hear experts in one rather narrow area being asked, by virtue of that expertise, to comment on something much broader, um, and, and that, that's not having competence, competence. Of course, they can comment as citizens, but that's different. And then finally, I think in quite a lot of the controversies, certainly the environmental controversies that, that I've looked at, um, one of the reasons that it seems that people don't trust experts is that experts address questions that might not be the ones that the people actually concerned about the issue care about. And the British House of Lords Science and Technology Committee looked at this issue 20 years ago in a report that's actually worn very well, and they put it like this. Some issue, issues treated by decision makers as scientific issues involve many other factors besides science, framing the problem wrongly by excluding moral, social, ethical and other concerns invites hostility. One might go a step further than the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee and suggest that even that distinction that the House of Lords there are still sticking to that um, involves many other factors besides science is still saying, here's science, absolutely epistemic only, and here are other factors. But... If we look, for example, to the work of Heather Douglas, which uh, I think Maria was mentioning earlier, um, she makes some very interesting arguments of particular interest to me because her empirical work was on toxicology and I serve as a social scientist on um, DEFRA's Hazardous Substances Advisory Committee, so what, a lot of what she was saying was very familiar to me. And her argument, I do it great violence by um, trying to encapsulate it very, very briefly, but she suggests that not only do we recognise that value judgments are, in fact, made at various stages of, of the scientific process, but that those judgments should be made at particular stages. She argues that scientists take inductive risk, the risk of being wrong at various stages in their work, choice of methodology, characterization and interpretation of data, acceptance, rejection of hypotheses, even the choice of hypotheses. And her argument in a nutshell is that where the risk of error, the inductive risk, includes risk of non-epistemic social, ethical, or political consequences, and those consequences can be foreseen, even if not in detail, value judgments have a required and legitimate role in good reasoning. It's a um, somewhat controversial argument, but I think extremely interesting. OK, let me move on quickly to the last few, few comments. Um, EOSA identified four pillars of um, expert advice which is, um, help, helps to make it trustworthy and helps to engender trust. Integrity, transparency, independence and accountability. So my comments now are going to overlap with this and I'm going to draw on the lessons of the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, which was by and large a trusted and, I think, trustworthy body for 41 years. Um, and I think demonstrating, I hope, that despite, despite the huge complexities of this area, it is possible to tease out some factors that help to generate trust. And there's an overlap here with the pillars, but not, an, not a complete overlap with the pillars. Um, so 
the Royal Commission had a number of characteristics that were typically upheld as being conducive to good advice or trustworthy advice. It was, broadly speaking, authoritative, independent, um, and its advice was defensible in the public realm because it published reports and they tended to be debated in Parliament as well. And it did, by and large, adhere to the principles and rules of conduct in public life. You can compare those with, with the pillars. I just want to say something about three attributes that seem to help to make the Commission a trusted and trustworthy body. One was epistemic authority, as one might expect. The second was autonomy or independence, as one might expect, but, 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 both of those characteristics are quite ambiguous. So what I think I can say is that it wasn't enough for those characteristics, those two, authority and autonomy, simply to be proclaimed by the Royal Commission itself or by the governments that initially set it up. Here is an authoritative independent body. Well, there have been lots of those, and they haven't had much effect at all. So there seem to be three other requirements if the body is actually to be perceived as trustworthy, authoritative and independent. First of all, as Stephen Hillgartner notes in his book, Science on Stage, a body must assert, cultivate and guard its own authority. It must act like as if it's authoritative and, uh, I would add, independent. It must assert and guard its independence. Secondly, these sorts of attributes, like authority and independence, which seem to be so important, must be conferred upon the body by others as well as believed in by itself. It's no good saying we are independent if everybody else thinks you're, you know, in the arms of, of government. And thirdly, its authority and independence must be demonstrated in real material outcomes over time. They have to be enacted there has to be outcome legitimacy, in, a, in other words. OK, I could say more, but, but I, 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 I won't. Um, there's a third one, though, that hasn't been mentioned <coughs> yet. A third, uh, what, a third attribute that, that really helps to make a body um, authoritative and independent and trusted. And that's epistemic diversity. So this was a body that was very diverse in its composition. It normally had about 14 members. And they came from a very wide variety of disciplines. It had epistemic diversity. It wasn't especially diverse in other ways. It liked to call itself a committee of experts, not an expert committee, because of its diversity. And it was that diversity of perspective combined with the individual members' individual competencies and epistemic authority that led to its trademark style of interdisciplinary deliberation, which was a very interesting process where everybody's presuppositions were challenged repeatedly. And I think that greatly helped in the production of epistemically robust and skillfully framed reports. One of the reasons the Royal Commission was trusted was that it, when it took a topic and wrestled with it for two years and then reported, people often felt that it had really bottomed out that topic, that it had somehow got to grips with it. And uh, that, that was helpful. And um, I think this, again, closely aligns with some of Katrina's findings um, that epistemic modesty, I like that idea, is closely related to the existence of cognitive diversity. So those are some um, factors which overlap with the traditionally accepted pillars of trust and trustworthiness 
but I think there are some, some complexities to them and some additional ones as well. Some final concluding thoughts very quickly. There are six of these if you're counting down. Okay. So, one, expert advice for all the talk of a crisis of trust in expertise. Expert advice is essential and it's often influential. Not always quickly, but it is. Secondly, there isn't that much evidence that it's widely distrusted. There are other things going on that make it seem or are sometimes presented as if it were distrust, which I think are misinterpreted. Thirdly, the attributes typically associated with trust and trustworthiness are ambiguous, sometimes rather fragile. For example, in the case of the Royal Commission and I think other bodies, authority and autonomy were as much a function of the Commission's actual practices and its actual achievements as they were of its constitution as a royal commission, it was in theory independent, or any codes of conduct that its members might have had to sign up to, or declarations of interest, or all the other things that somehow now seem to be associated with trustworthiness. Fourth, um, the ideal, it is an ideal, the ideal of um, advice and policy informed as far as possible by the available evidence is certainly worth striving for. We don't chuck that baby out with the complexity bathwater, as it were. Um, but three, a, a number of things important to remember in that context. First, good advice has both epistemic and discursive dimensions. Secondly, as Eron Israhi put it so beautifully in 1980, when scientific uncertainties combine with unsettled, ambiguous, or contradictory human ends, science and politics interpenetrate. And uh, thirdly, I think one of the things that was really brought home to me by my study of the Royal Commission was that too blind an insistence on the separation of science and politics impedes an understanding of productive advisory practices. Five, nearly there, epistemic diversity enables the production of robust, trustworthy advice. I would go further and I'm pushing this, though not with success at the moment, all advisory bodies to government, even if they apparently deal with something very narrowly scientific, should be epistemically diverse. They should have people on them, not as quote-unquote lay members, but as active, you know, fully member members, um, uh, people from the humanities and the social sciences as well. The transformation is extraordinary when, when people's presuppositions are challenged. And six, finally, the best and most far-reaching expert advice is often the most unwelcome, especially in the short term, sometimes known as Thomas Beckett syndrome. Um, <laughs> You know, it's not always welcome. So if experts are to be effective and ultimately trusted, then political actors must at least be open to some disruptive advice. Thank you very much. Excellent, so yeah, sincere okay. ideas. We, uh, we don't, uh, according to the program, we don't have much time now for questions. I don't know, can we use five extra minutes? Or should we? Yes, a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. So, time for a few very brief questions. Yes, please. Um, 
So you mentioned like... Um, Can you really introduce yourself? Oh, oh yes, I'm Carlo Martini from um, San Rafael University, Milan. Uh, although, not to worry, anyone coming from Helsinki at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I am the um, local PI for work package um, plans on uh, behavioral tools for building trust. Um, so you mentioned like um, it doesn't look like expert advice is generally mistrusted. Um, but there's a few, I guess, issues in science. For example, I think of vaccines, where even a little bit of mistrust is enough to create um, a big problem. Yes. So I wonder if you have any comments on that, because in those cases it seems like you need like almost blind trust. In, yes. In um, no, I, I, I won't comment in detail. I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, that, that is such a crucial area. And um, it, a little bit of mistrust, but that mistrust being, as we've seen earlier today, incredibly effectively propagated and, and communicated. Um, I think sometimes it would be quite good if um, there was a, an exposition of what, what are the risks, if any, associated with, with vaccination. Because the problem with the, 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 um, the anti-vax campaign is that it, it tended to generate a, um, a very vehement response that, you know, you are being morally reprehensible if you don't want be vaccinated and, and somehow a sense that there are no risks at all associated with vaccination. So how we move from what the current situation to one where there's a, a measured discussion of, of risk, which in many cases will be very, very small, but um, we know that people judge risk on different dimensions and the risk to your child, for example, is going to be seen as, as big. So, yes, I completely agree, but the, we need to find ways of generating um, more of a, a discussion. Okay, uh, final, very brief question. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, so my name is Marius Berg. Um, I was wondering if your attributes that you propose and group of experts should have in order to generate trust could you, do you think those attributes should also be applied to um, citizens' assemblies, like in the discussions of this morning? And do you think that institutionalizing citizens' assemblies would promote or do the opposite to um, these, these attributes? Yeah, that's a very, very good question because. Um, you could say what applies to one institution should, a, should apply to others in, in terms of, of trust and, and, and trustworthiness. So I think some of them probably you could say did a, would apply. They are, you know, they, they meet some of, of the pillars. But I, I'm conscious also of, of work that shows that deliberative practices also generate certain expressions of power and you know bias and, and they're not immune from those issues. Um, I'd also like to see more ways of coupling those processes to representative democracy or more detail on how that's done because as we heard this morning um, they're not always well coupled. They, they do. And if we can enthuse people about those processes, we're also, nothing, didn't hear about it, but they're very resource intensive, hugely resource intensive, and have to be kept up, then why can't we enthuse people about the institutions of representative democracy, which are multiple? Mm -hmm. um, so I think those questions are important. And there's a practical one, which the um, American political scientist Dahl wrote a very nice little book about, simply called Democracy, um, about 20 years ago. The actual logistical difficulties of everybody being able to deliberate on all of the issues that face modern democracies is extremely challenging. I think 
Oscar Wilde once said about socialism that it takes up too many evenings. Um, you know, there is this real challenge of, of that. So, broadly, I agree. They should be, they are also bodies that should have some kind of accountability as well. Okay, thank you.